The Bain Free Radio Hour. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afsharirad. Today, we welcome Christopher Rocchio back into the Bain fold. As listeners to the podcast may know, Christopher is a longtime friend of Bain. For several years, he was an assistant editor with the company, though he left to write full time. Now he's back at Bain but not as an editor. Christopher is the author of the critically acclaimed and wildly popular Sun Eater series, and we are extremely excited to announce that Bain Books will be publishing the final two novels in that series. In just a moment, we'll hear from Christopher about the Sun Eater series and his Bain homecoming, but first, the news. The May hardcovers and trade paperbacks are in. First up, For Love of Magic by Simon R. Green. Once upon a time, there was a forgotten era of magic and monster, but the old world has been replaced by the sane, the scientific, and the rational. But sometimes the magical past isn't content to stay past. That's where Jack Damon comes in. It's his job to protect our present from the supernatural remnants of an earlier time. A different history. Next up is the Ross 248 Project, edited by Les Johnson and Ken Roy. Traveling to the stars will be difficult, but not perhaps as difficult as finding worlds that are potentially habitable and then taking the time to make them compatible with Earth life. Join this diverse group of science fiction writers and scientists as they take up the challenge of the Ross 248 Project. And now for something a bit different. Readers everywhere have been devouring, pun intended, John Ringo's zombie SF series Black Tide Rising. Well, we're thrilled to announce that the series is getting a graphic novel treatment. That's right, Black Tide Rising is Bane's first ever graphic novel adapted by comics legend Chuck Dixon. It's John Ringo's Black Tide Rising series as you've never seen it before. And that's it for the news. Welcome to the Bane Free Radio Hour, where making his triumphant return to the Bane Free Radio Hour in his first appearance since becoming an officially banked Bane author, welcome back, Christopher Rocchio. Hey man, thanks for having me. Christopher, I know some of our viewers are very familiar with you from your years of hosting and working here at Bain, but for those of you who might be new, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Sun Eater series. Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, Christopher Rocchio. I used to work for Bain. I was junior editor for seven years, I think. I was also an intern for a bit. Some people think I was an intern for longer than I was. Uh, but I'm also uh, the author of the Sun Eater series, uh, which actually sold to uh, Doll Books about a week before uh, I was hired to work here. Uh, and so I lived a double life for a long time. I wrote five books over there with them. Uh, and uh, the last two books of the Sun Eater series are coming back home, uh, which is a bit of a story. But, uh, but here I am. Uh, Sun Eater is, uh, like I said, a science fantasy series. It's set about 20,000 years in our future. Uh, it's got a bit of a Star Wars thing going on, but not a galaxy far, far away. Uh, it's uh, the story of a guy called Hadrian. Hadrian is a nobleman who runs away from home, uh, you know, uh, in this big galactic empire, and he gets caught in the middle of a war between said empire and an alien species called the Sielsen, who in all that time are the first uh, extraterrestrial uh, race to ever really give humanity uh, trouble. Uh, and so he tells you on page one, the books are written sort of like a memoir, well they are written like a memoir, that he's made into that war and dealt with the Sielsen. His story is why and how and about all the things that didn't make it into the official history. Uh, I like to joke that he is uh, sort of like Anakin Skywalker of becoming Darth Vader were the best of his available options, um, which people tend to think is funny. So We'll get a bit more into that in a bit, especially since there might be a lot of people tuning in that haven't picked up the series, in which case, boy, are you folks in for a ride. But I suppose we should start and get the blood flowing with a few frequently asked questions so that people stop asking you and us. So, lightning round. How goes the process on Disquiet Gods? 
Do we have an EARC date? Do we have a release date? Uh, so I believe the release date is going to be the first Tuesday of April 2024. I don't know what day that is off the top of my head. Uh, Sean is telling me it is the second. Uh, but uh, I don't know about the EARC just yet. Uh, I have, however, finished the first draft, uh, Just Quite Gods, is book six. Uh, in the series. Uh, I turned that in earlier this month. It is currently April 2023, so with about a year to get everything uh, sort of uh, spit polished and shined and, and ready to go. Um, the arc, if I had to guess, probably be uh, around the holidays, but um, you know, these things are, uh, you know, you guys know how it is, your pain. These things can be a little bit uh, imprecise sometimes, so we'll, uh, we'll know that when we know it. Uh, but it's exciting, you know, because it is book six in the series that have uh, you know, some early uh, early access for uh, readers who've been plugging along through one through five is uh, pretty pretty cool. So I think that'll be fun. Now, an always an important question when a series comes to a new publisher: Is anything changing about the book design? Ah, uh, yes. No. So I uh, my, my readers really like my covers, and so uh, I knew this was going to be a question because um, you know I every single time uh, people have, I've had a new book come out, they're like, "Are we losing Kieran?" Uh, and uh, especially uh, with uh, with the move between publishers, people are like, oh my gosh, Kieran Yander, the artist, we're losing him. No, we're not. Uh, Kieran's going to stick around. Uh, I believe the plan is to match the title fonts and everything. Everything's going to look exactly the same. Uh, the only thing that will be changing will be the colophon on Spy and the publisher logo. Uh, you know, nothing we can do about that, nor should. So uh, everything else should look pretty much the same. Uh, obviously, like you know, if things are a little bit off. I'm going to have to ask my readers to calm down. It'll be fine. Uh, the important thing is that the books are uh, as designed. So, We do love Kieran here as much as Christopher and his fans do. Now, j this one's just for fun, but we have a lot of people ask because we know you're a fan of Tolkien and you're a fan of Gene Wolfe. Oh boy. If you had to pick one, well, deathmatch style, who do you pick? Uh, man, that's, like, I have to choose, like, which one I'm keeping, like, if I'm going to a desert island or something. Yeah. I thought the question was, like, who's a better writer? Uh, but if I had to keep one, it, it would still be Tolkien, you know, no, I think, I think Gene would agree with me, uh, you know, but, um, you know, I, I, Tolkien is the writer, uh, that I have read the most, which obviously a bit of a cliche among fantasy and science fiction writers, but he, he is the best of us. Uh, full stop, period. Uh, I, I will brook no argument on the subject. I threw an intern out of the office once because he hadn't read it yet. He had to go read it and come back. Uh, he, uh, he did come back, you know, having not uh, finished reading, but uh, still threw, threw him out. Uh, in any case, uh, um, uh, yeah, no, so it's, it'd have to be Tolkien. But Gene Wolfe is, I think, the better writer in terms of technique and style and things like that. Uh, but he's trying to do things that are more complicated than sort of Tolkien's more traditional, state, straightforward narrative style. But Tolkien has um, sort of a, a, a depth to him. That, that book I've read, I've read Lord of the Rings maybe, and I'm not exaggerating, maybe a hundred times in my life. And uh, it's, one of, it, it's one of the very few books, I think, that you can read that many times and still find new things in it. Um, that's true of Gene's work as well, uh, but Tolkien is just, uh, like I say, he's just the best of us. Now, we got to break the title for book six when we announced we were signing you, Disquiet Gods. What's the title of book seven? Uh, the title of book seven is a secret, Sean, uh, and you know it's a secret. I told you this before. No, uh, no, but it's, uh, no, it's a secret. Now, some of our Bane readers might not be familiar with your work, and for those Bane readers who are watching this on YouTube and Rumble, links to some of Christopher's excellent summaries of the Sun Eater books will be in the description. But for those of you tuning in now, Christopher, if you could, Sell them on the Sun Eater series. Well, I did the elevator pitch already a little bit, but to go, I guess, a step beyond that, uh, this is sort of a big, it's a big space opera. It's in the tradition of Dune. Um, I, I am and have been a huge uh, Frank Herbert fan. Uh, so if you like that sort of uh, like old school, old style, uh, very Byzantine space opera, uh, this is uh, this is that sort of story. Um, you know, we're dealing with uh, you know thousands of planets. Uh, of course, we only see you know a few of them, right? But uh, we're dealing with thousands of planets. Uh, we're dealing with lots of different, uh, most mostly human uh, nations. Uh, politics on a grand scale. 
Uh, we've got aliens, though. Uh, it's one of the principal differences uh, between uh, me and some of those older galactic empires, uh, especially you know, like, like Foundation, like Dune. Uh, you don't really have a lot of uh, but aliens in them, if at all. Uh, so we've got uh, this big alien uh, enemy, the Sielsen, uh, who sort of play the role of Huns to the human empire's Rome, right? They are, uh, they're humanoid, uh, but they are nomadic, they are uh, anthropophagic, so they, they will eat you, uh, despite being relatively civilized, uh, relatively being the key word. Uh, and, um, and so the series looks uh, very deeply at like sort of the psychological differences between humans and things that aren't human, uh, we've also got uh, sort of barbarians who live between the stars outside of imperial order. Uh, they practice all the things that are very illegal in the empire, uh, things like transhumanism, uh, like uh, like robotics, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, big no-no, uh, part of my inheritance from Frank Herbert, so to speak. Um, but I, you know, just have been a science fiction fan since I was, you know, uh, just a little kid. And um, I always wanted to tell a story, and this is a story that I've been working on my whole life in some form or other. Uh, so it's kind of a kitchen sink project. You know, if there was an idea that I had, um, you know, it went into this series. Um, and so um, it's quite, I think, expansive. It's got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we've got some great characters. Uh, you know, we've got sword fights. We have, you know, uh, starship battles. Uh, we have, uh, like I say, spooky aliens. Uh, politics, uh, assassination, murder, romance, sounding like Grandpa from Princess Bride, but such is it, uh, you know. So uh, I hope everybody will uh, will check it out. The first book is Empire of Silence. Uh, there are five books out uh, over with Daw right now, but being like I said, we're picking up six and seven to finish the series out. Uh, but I don't plan on leaving the setting ever, so you know I, I plan on doing some more stuff with it as time goes on. So. You touched on some of this already, but there isn't a whole lot of that classical space opera in the vein of Herbert, Wolf, and you're very much the heir to that tradition with your own Shakespearean, both meticulous attention to detail and deliciously written prose. Oh, thanks. What shaped your writing style like that and what drew you to write this kind of genre, especially when especially in modern science fiction, there just isn't a lot of it. But as far as uh, what made me want to write this in the first place, it was just being a Star Wars kid uh, starting out. Uh, my dad had a laser disc player, so I like to joke that I was like the last kid in America who saw the unlucas versions of the, uh, the original movies. Uh, you know, so, um, so that, was, that was a start for me. I think the first book I bought was either some like young reader Jedi Knight adventure story uh, but it might have been one of the, the proper Star Wars uh, like expanded universe novels from the from the 90s I uh, can't remember which one it might have been maybe maybe Zahn I don't know but um, so I was a Star Wars kid and I, um, I segued into Dune sometime in middle school uh, I had a friend who uh, told me I should check it out um, and um, and so uh, and then I, I managed to go to one of those those magnet schools where we had a uh, a a, um, a science fiction literature class in ninth grade um, that was expressly a science fiction literature class it was taught by an old school Capital F fan uh, Mr Goheen and Mr Goheen made sure that uh, I had read you know Van Vogt and uh, you know uh, Asimov Heinlein uh, Niven Purnell uh, and you know. Uh, more recent stuff too, um, you know, more recent for him. But my uh, my reading uh, tends to skew a little bit more, I guess. Uh, we'll say antique. Uh, you know, with uh, I, I usually don't uh, encounter people who've read uh, as much Vance or Paul Anderson as I have. I want to talk to readers who are my age, right? These are mostly who are you talking about, Christopher? What? Um, and so uh, I sort of went through uh, a lot of the older stuff. Uh, when I was in high school, and uh, that's just what I always wanted to write, um, you know. So as for my writing style, um, I have a rhetoric, <laughs> I have a rhetoric degree because I hate money. Uh, I uh, I thought I was going to be a technical writer. I took a couple tech writing classes my last year in college. I was like, oh, that's terrible. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and fortunately, you know, got my job here at Bain. So I I do think I'm the only. Uh, English degree holder I know who has an in who had an English related job, uh, but uh, but no. So I, I have a background in in rhetoric and writing style and things like that. So um, you know I, I fortunately managed to find a career where I can actually use that. So you know, good for me, I guess. And for us all, now I know a lot of interviewers have asked you about your interest in science fantasy or. The particulars of your writing style. 
but I'm not most interviewers. I want to ask you instead, not just that you draw about from classics like Tolkien, Vance, Wolf, but that throughout your books you can see references and hints of everything from video games like Golden Sun to anime and manga like Berserk. Sure. And there just isn't a whole lot of epic space opera that references Griffith and Golden Sun, so... <laughs> I might be the only one. Uh, tell me what started that and why. Well, really, I think the larger, the largest volume of, uh, you know, media that I have enjoyed uh, has been video games, has been, you know, cartoons. Uh, you know, as much reading as I've done, uh, you know, video games are more time-consuming sort of by the nature of the medium, right? So I, like, I grew up playing a lot of, uh, a lot of JRPGs, right? Gold Sun, for example, Gold Sun's so good. Uh, you know, but uh, Lost Odyssey, Back Kaito's Tales of Symphonia. Not really a Final Fantasy guy, sorry. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I just never got into those. Uh, but um, Which is why there are no belt buckles on Hadrian. That's true, uh, you know, or at least one. Uh, not 27. But um, in any case, um, you know, so I have this, this sort of whole extra kind of, uh, you know, mode of influence, I guess, from, from those stories. Because uh, one of the things so interesting, right, about, you know, reading stories from other cultures generally, but specifically with Japanese stories, is they, they, don't, they don't use the Aristotelian plot structure. Right? They don't have a tradition of going back to poetics, right? They have um, a different it's a four act structure. I can't remember the Japanese name of, but um, they're structured somewhat differently, uh, and tonally they tend to be quite different. It's it's not unusual to see like very stupid, silly jokes in very dark stories. Um, uh, it's becoming more common in Western media, in part because of uh, of the influence there. But um, but but there is there is certainly a lot of sort of structural and tonal uh, differences between these. Uh, between Japanese storytelling and Western storytelling traditionally, um, and I, I have a very I have a background in Aristotle. Right? Uh, you know, actually, Tony uh, makes sure that everybody reads Poetics when they get here as an intern. Uh, I already had, but uh, the copy of Poetics I have is the one Tony gave me. Um, but I have you know this extra angle here from from all of that stuff because it's all good, right? You know, and um, you know a writer is uh, the sum of not just you know, his own experiences, but the other stories that he takes in. And writing, you know, art itself is a conversation uh, across the generations between artists uh, and writers and, you know, um, filmmakers, musicians, whatever. Um, and uh, the point of art is to be in that conversation. And so to reference other people's work uh, helps build sort of and strengthen, uh, you know, symbolic uh, resonance and connections and things like that. Uh, I, you know, I'm not shy about who my influences are, uh, you know, um, I, I sort of think about, I think of talking about them as sort of uh, citing my sources, so to speak. Uh, because like, we're all that guy, right? We all uh, play games, read stories, and we're like, this is pretty good, but like, what if we did this instead, right? And like, how could I use that difference, that idea that I just had, right, to do something I think is more interesting or you know, better even. Um, and, and that's sort of been a huge component of, of how I go about crafting my stories in the first place is, is sort of looking at other things and thinking like, oh, like, like we put those two together, you know, and this is very normal. I think we all, we all write this way um, to some degree. So. Well, we've talked a lot about what's past and some of your influences. Let's talk about what's coming, Disquiet Gods. If you don't mind, uh, what can longtime Sun Eater fans expect, especially after that ending in Ashes of Man? You horrid, horrid man. Uh, well, I'm not very nice, that's true. Uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, I guess I can say that um, Disquiet Gods uh, picks up quite some time uh, after the end of Ashes of Man. I won't say how long. I will say it is the longest gap between any of the books. Uh, the shortest one being between you know four and five, it was like one night, uh, which was very unusual for the series. We tend to skip several decades of time because uh, in this setting, right, people live for centuries. At least some people live for centuries. Hadrian being one of them. Um, it takes decades to get between planets. Um, they do have warp drive, but space is really big, uh, you know. And so uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, Hadrian is not in a great place. Uh, he has not been in a great place for a long time. Uh, and, um, but he, he gets a call, a call that he was not really expecting, uh, but like knew might come at some point, uh, and he needs to get back into it because they, um, 
you know, they being the Emperor, needs him uh, to go on, uh, on one last mission, despite the fact that he and the Emperor are not really friends anymore. This mission is important enough to sort of get him back into the action. It's very much the, uh, the sort of aging action hero uh, <laughs> uh, premise here as we get things started up. Uh, I don't want to be too specific about what that, um, that mission is, but if you've read particularly The Ashes of Man, there's a certain conversation between the Emperor and uh, Hadrian. You might, you might can guess what, uh, what that, uh, what that uh, request is, what that impossible task may be. Uh, and so the book starts with uh, Hadrian going about this impossible task we're trying to, and we uh, we sort of go from there. Nice John Wick reference, by the way. Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose it is. If, uh, uh, without, as you said, revealing too much, were there any moments in this book you were particularly looking forward to write? Oh, sure. Uh, so when I when I thought about uh, The Sun Weird, right, originally I thought, I, you know, you have no idea how long a series is going to be, uh, especially if you're a new writer like you know I was uh, I guess hey, I'm, I haven't finished my first series still am I still a new writer uh, but like you you have to think about the series as a whole right and like this is a series because it's written like a memoir where I tell you the beginning or I tell you the end at the beginning right I tell you we're gonna blow up a sun uh, these aliens are going away um, and the story really is about how do we get there right how do we get from you know this idealistic kid who wants to make peace and make friends with the aliens to you know, uh, going to war with them um, terminally. And, uh, and and so the story is this journey, right? But I know along that journey, there are a bunch of benchmarks we need to hit. I know, you know, as I get into it, like, oh, that benchmark's in book two, right? So there are things that I've been thinking about that are in book six, uh, maybe even in book six particularly, that, uh, you know, that I was looking forward to writing, particularly towards the end. Um, I honestly, like, don't know how to even give clues for some of them. Uh, you know, uh, but but you know there are uh, there are scenes uh, in in the story that I you know would wake up kind of every day like thinking about even when I was writing like two books ago and be like oh man it'd be cool to write that uh, eventually and uh, and and we got there because this the universe is sort of uh, progressively expanded book to book right it gets it gets weirder <laughs> and uh, and more complex right you introduce new elements as the series goes on again that's kind of normal but like the weirder it gets for me the more fun gets even though that makes it more complicated and so we're dealing with um you know some pretty it's pretty eldritch stuff in this book let's just say and uh, it gets kind of weird and out there and uh extra dimensional and that's kind of fun um so uh hopefully uh you know people will be excited for that there are some familiar faces we're going to go back to some familiar places uh so you can look forward to that as well but i think you know, if I'm going to say anything that will get long-time readers excited about this, I think this book structurally is most like Demon in White, which was book three. And Demon in White is reliably the one that people say is their favorite book. I think this book has the most in common with that book. Even if tonally it is quite different, um, I think structurally it bears a lot in common. So I think hopefully that will get people excited without spoiling anything. And again, without spoiling anything... What does it set up for book seven as we build toward the grand finale? Well, it sets up the grand finale, right? We get all the pieces sort of, uh, sort of in the board, right? You know, in, in a chess game, there are three phases, right? There's the opening. The openings are all pretty finite. They're very well understood because there are only so many pieces and so many squares on the board and only so many ways to move them. So everybody kind of knows the first five to 20 moves of a chess game. If you're, you know, one of the, one of the Magnus Carlsons of the world, you see someone move a thing, you know what the next 20 moves are, no problem. Right? Then you get in the middle of the game, and the middle of the game is a lot mushier and harder to figure out, right? Because uh, you might be playing, a player is doing something really weird, right? Or doesn't know what they're doing, and it moves the game into a weird place. And it's kind of like that writing, uh, writing a series. You get in the middle, and a lot of stuff is a little bit more, more flexible. Uh, but now, you know, these last two books really are the end game. When you get to the end game in chess, you've cleared out, you know, 60% of the pieces, 70% of the pieces, and there are rules to like how you get to checkmate when you've got you know just the just the queen and the king or you got your two rooks and the king right you gotta play against the guy's two bishops right there are ways to do that and the sort of program is understood and i'm sort of in that phase right i i've got all the pieces where they need to be for the final engagement obviously we're going to blow up a sun in book seven that i can tell you because i i've been telling people for years uh so we're going we're building towards this big you know set piece battle um, but there are probably parts of that battle that people are not anticipating. I always laugh when I read uh, reviews of book one and people are like, oh, this stupid writer, he gave away the ending, you fool. I, I, no, that's, that's not how books work. Uh, you know, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other stuff 
that uh, that's that's got to come into play. And I think there are still a lot of surprises for people, uh, particularly with regard to just how darn weird it's going to get. So uh, you know, you have that to look forward to. Especially given that Hadrian himself isn't exactly the most reliable narrator. Well, Hadrian's a little complicated. Uh, I think he lies less than uh, people believe he does. I think the tendency that readers have is to look at a first-person narrator and say, this man is a liar, all right? First-person narrators are unreliable narrators. And um, that's true to an extent, but I, I think that we as science fiction fans have sort of internalized that um, you know, and made sort of a trope out of it, made almost a meme out of it. Uh, I don't think that Hadrian is trying to lie. Uh, I just think he uh, is unreliable in the way that we all are, particularly, like, he's not necessarily the best at understanding other people and their motivations sometimes, right? Especially people who are close to him, which I think is a lot of us. So the way that Hadrian, I think, is unreliable is that, like, he doesn't understand uh, his friends and why they're his friends, which, again, I think is a lot of us. But I don't think he's out there trying to make himself look that much better because it's uh, a sort of a tall order, I think. So it's... Uh, so, but yes, on, you know, there, there are some places where he maybe can't be relied upon completely. Now, the other thing is that while this might be your first novel with Bane, our more avid readers should know this is not the first time you've had your name on the cover of a book. You've been in dozens of our anthologies, on the cover of many of our anthologies, including most recently World's Long Lost. I believe that I've edited eight. It might be nine. Well, for some of your longtime fans who maybe might not have picked up some of those, which, given there's a Sun Eater story in each of them, That's you true. should, do you have any favorites? And if so, what are they? Uh, well, my favorite one is Sword and Planet, because that's the one I did by myself. So I edited a collection of classic Sword and Planet, John Carter-style science fantasy stories. Uh, that was all me, because uh, most of the uh, anthologies I worked on uh, I was either working with Tony Daniel uh, or was working with Hank Davis doing reprints of older stories. And those are both, you know, both great editors. Those are all great experiences. But with Sword and Planet, I was allowed to sort of call my own shots, do my own thing. That was the kind of story I really wanted to read, you know, as opposed to one that I was assigned as an employee. So that was sort of my, my baby, I guess, as an anthology. Uh, and it's cool for a couple of reasons. I put a novella in it, uh, in part because I think like three uh, authors dropped out on me while I was putting that collection together uh, for various illnesses. This was in 2020. Uh, and um, while it was delayed a little bit coming out, uh, the novella, uh, Queen of Mid Ashes, is one of my favorite shorter things that I've written. Uh, set between uh, books two and three of the series, but you can totally read it cold. It's got a little bit of, I think of them as teasers more than spoilers, really, but uh, that story is one I'm particularly proud of. Uh, it kind of works through the uh, sort of the moral questions of the Sun Eater kind of in microcosm. So I think it's a, I think it's a good place to get in there. You get to see the aliens, you, uh, you get to deal with Hadrian, because it's written from his point of view, it's written in the same style as the books. Uh, so that's a really fun story. But I also uh, got to put, uh, there's a Simon Green story in there, it was his first Deathstalker story in I think like 30 years, which is kind of cool. It was really cool that he dusted off the, uh, the old franchise for me. Uh, and my friend uh, Anthony Martezzi uh, got his first story put in there because nepotism is totally a thing. Uh, but Anthony is like we all, as writers, have this friend who like we all know is the best writer that we know, but like he won't write because of one reason or another. And I got him to write for this one, and it is a very weird uh, story. It's almost kind of got a magical realism angle to it, but it's uh, it's sort of a science fantasy Count of Monte Cristo Doctor Who, but it's very Byzantine, uh, by which I mean Greek. Uh, cause, cause he is, and uh, and it is uh, is a really cool story. It's the only thing he's published, uh, but I got to publish it, which was very awesome. Cause this is a guy I've been friends with since college, right? So that's a really good one. Obviously, Sean's gonna uh, strangle me if I don't mention World's Long Lost, which is my last anthology with Bane. It's a collection of Xeno archaeology stories that I brought Sean on, uh, cause Sean, is, you know, is among my replacements here at the office. Uh, and uh, my, my duties were sort of distributed. It took more than one to replace uh, Christopher. Something like that. Uh, well, they sort of split up what it was I was doing. But we brought Sean on to sort of uh, sort of junior edit with me on that one. That one turned out pretty well. Uh, it's got a really cool Bob Eggleton cover, which was sort of the inspiration. So we had this extra piece of artwork, and we're like, what the heck do we do with this? We paid for it. We need to get, a, we need to get this on a book. So we, we did an anthology of sort of, mostly it turned out to be mostly Lovecraftian, uh, sort of uh, alien ruin stories. That was not particularly, I was thinking more Indiana Jones, more Stargate when we started, but sometimes uh, anthologies get away from you and they become something else. 
Uh, I may have contributed a little bit of the uh, the Lovecraft myself. So uh, I thought I was going to be the odd guy out, but apparently all uh, anybody thinks about space anymore is that it's real spooky. So. And how many Sun Eater short stories have you written? And of course, I have to ask, how do you always find one, no matter what the theme for the anthology is? Sure. Uh, well, I've written about two dozen now. Um, not just for, for Bane anthologies, but I've done my own stuff. Uh, most recently, I had a story called The Royal Game uh, appear in Grimdark magazine, uh, which was really cool. Uh, it was the first time anyone's asked me to do a magazine story, which was neat. Uh, but um, as far as like figuring out how to, how, to, how to fit a story in any of these things, because this is an ongoing joke with Sean and me here, uh, you know, is that I always seem to figure out how to make this universe fit whatever the prompt is. And the secret is simply that I'm given a prompt. And uh, if someone's like, uh, we're doing a collection of courtroom stories, then I'm like, oh, well, how would I make a courtroom work in the Sun Eater setting? And some of them are harder than others, right? But, uh, you know, it's, it's not... Uh, actually, it's easier uh, doing it this way than coming up with a story in, like, a complete vacuum. If someone's like, look, we have to do a story about pirates, I'm like, okay, like, we'll start with pirates and we'll go from there. Uh, and, and figure out how to work. Because the thing is, is, you know, all of the premises that are coming from anthologies are rooted in something that exists in the real world, right? Like pirates, like courtrooms, for example. Uh, you know, and so if the world is big enough to contain all of these ideas, uh, surely a fictional world can be made big enough uh, to contain all the ideas. Obviously, if someone's like, look, we're doing, a, we're doing an anthology about gnomes, like there are no gnomes in, uh, in, High, in, uh, in uh, Sun Eater. Uh, and so um, I would just pass. So uh, in order to maintain my perfect kill death ratio, but um, you know, um, it's not a fantasy series. So we shall endeavor to find the one that will make Christopher break. And speaking of making Christopher break, you've been working with Mr. Dave Butler, one oh, of yeah. our editors on Disquiet Gods. I know he's been a Long-time friend, but at the same time, what's it like working with him as an editor? And I certainly know it's been fun watching him dive into the Sun Eater series. Well, sure. No, Dave, Dave and I have been friends for a long time now. Uh, he is one of the best people I know, so it was very cool uh, that he's editing the books. Uh, you know, I'm in good hands. We haven't really gotten into it yet, though. Uh, the one thing uh, is that I'm, I'm used to having to wait six, seven months to get uh, notes back, and I turned the book in a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm going to get it before the end of this month. So uh, I am uh, not used to the shorter break. Uh, you know, I've got some short stories I'm trying to rush out the door before he gets back to me. Uh, but he's uh, – honestly, by the time this airs, I probably will have received the notes back. So, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, quite a difference. Um, you know, usually I have time to go through and translate all of the alien languages and things uh, before my editor gets back to me, so I'm not playing the translation game and editing at the same time. Um, that's not happening this time, so uh, you know that is uh, that's a bit of a difference. But uh, but Dave's Dave's the best man, uh, you know, so uh, it's it's gonna be fun. Now to put on my Bane media liaison hat for a moment. One thing that's very exciting about you and Sun Eater is just the amount of praise you've gotten over the years, whether it be from heavy metal music festivals, analog science fiction and fact, and authors like James S.A. Corey. But of course, as a newly minted Bane author, you look at the list of Bane authors over the years that have gushed about how much they love you and Sun Eater. Larry Correa, DJ Butler, David Drake, even the late great Eric Flynn. What's it like knowing so many authors read your work and that it spoke to them the same way it speaks to you? It was, uh, it was very cool. Uh, now, obviously, we, uh, we asked uh, all those guys if they would read it and give me blurbs, right? Um, you know, I have sort of, Ben has always sort of, in a sense, been my publisher, right? Uh, because uh, they, uh, they helped me get a lot of blurbs uh, starting out. Uh, my first, I think it was my, my second Liberty Con, I was, um, I was there, it was when the book was coming out, and uh, Tony had slid a, 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 a slide into her presentation uh, for the convention, we had like maybe 200 people in the audience, right, uh, about the books and talking about how I was a traitor, because I published elsewhere, uh, you know, uh, 
but like the book was still good, so you should go read it. And uh, David Drake, uh, you know, stood up and, and said in front of all those people that I it was a good book and that they should go check it out. Uh, and you know, Dave is um, he's not he's not easy with his uh, he's not easy with his praise. So that was very cool, uh, very special. Uh, you know, and then Eric stood up. It was kind of a Spartacus situation, which was also very cool. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, I think Gray Reinhardt because uh, he had. Because uh, I had submitted the book to Bain, uh, Daw just gave me a really good deal uh, out the gate, uh, and it was it was worth taking. You know, I had no regrets about any of my choices there. Uh, but he was he also said that it was uh, you know that he liked the book a lot. It, it is uh, I do not receive uh, compliments very well. I never know what to say. Um, you know, so I was mostly embarrassed and uh, tried to hide. But uh, you know, it, it is very it's very awesome. Um, it's cool if anybody likes your books, but. To have you know Dave Drake and you know Eric and uh, and you know, Larry and any of these guys say nice things is amazing. So yeah, I, you know, thanks guys. If any of you see this, um, you know, one of many reasons we're very proud to be bringing Christopher home. But of course, some of your readers might be new to Bane, in which case, while they're waiting for disquiet gods. Are there any particular books or authors you'd like to recommend they check out while they wait? Yeah, sure. So my favorite series Bane has ever published all time, uh, and I saw Sean mention this in the questions on the printout, but didn't ask it out loud, is uh, Lois McMaster Bujold's Borkoskin series. It's it's just great. It's just so much fun. Miles is, I think, the best leading man in a science fiction series ever. I uh, love that guy. Uh, it's, just, it's just so awesome. And she is, uh, Lois is like the best character writer uh, that I know of, just in science fiction, uh, across the board. She just handles humanity with a delicacy and attention to detail. It's just beautiful. And I really like writers that I'm not like, right? Like, I'm very verbose and descriptive, and Lois isn't. Like, very stylistically different. And uh, I don't understand how she does what she does, but what she does is amazing. She's great. Um, I, uh, more recently, you know, when I, when I worked here, we added Tim Powers to our collection. Tim is one of the greatest fantasy writers alive, right? Sort of an inheritor of like the weird tales tradition of fantasy, right? People used to be like, why is Lovecraft the face of the World Fantasy Award? Well, because that was fantasy. Uh, it was fantasy for decades, right? And Tim kind of writes in that vein. Uh, it's not uh, it's not a Bane novel, but his uh, his vampire book, The Stress of Herbergard, is my favorite vampire book uh, ever. Uh, vampire is my favorite monster. It's so, so good. Uh, of course, he has a werewolf novel coming out for us this a, year. Does have a werewolf novel coming out? I don't know the title of that one, but it's uh, it's about the Bronte sisters. My brother's keeper. My brother's keeper. Uh, it's about the Bronte sisters and werewolves. Very excited to read that. I know Butler uh, did some work on it. Told me it was awesome, uh, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, but like uh, alternate routes and uh, forced perspectives, uh, those are great. I can't remember the name of the third one uh, in that in that series, but uh, but those are all awesome. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, Dave himself, you know, regular host here on the podcast these days, but Witchy Eye is super cool, uh, you know, alternate history, sort of flintlock fantasy set in, like, Jackson-era America, but it is an America that Dave has meticulously uh, turned into a fantasy set. Dave is probably sort of the best world builder that I know, uh, one of the best writers that I know, but certainly the best world builder that I know, much better, much better than me. Uh, you know, this is a man who taught himself Ojibwe so he could write his Ojibwe characters. That is so far beyond, uh, you know, my level of skill. You know, I just, he's a writer I am perpetually in awe of. And, uh, you know, like I said, he's a friend, so I'm obviously biased, but he's, uh, he's great. So those are usually my, like, three go-tos. Uh, obviously, you know, the greats are the greats, right? Uh, you know, whatever, Flint, Drake, uh, you know, Larry Korea. Um, but, uh, but those are usually, those are my three when I, when I, when I want to pick up Bane. Uh, author to recommend to someone. It's, it's Bujold, it's Butler, it's Powers. Um. Now, I know we might have let on some of your longtime fans when we mentioned hardcovers. We've been talking a lot, well, you certainly have, about a secret project. Sure. Can we let the cat out of the bag? Uh, do the hardcover reprint of Empire of Silence. So, um, my series has been famously out of print and hardcover for a very long time. Uh, you can only get the first book in mass market paperback, which is not ideal for some people. Uh, but I uh, have the ability to do a limited run uh, on the first couple books in the series. Uh, so we're starting with book one. Uh, very cool. We'll have some, uh, we have some original cover art 
by a guy named James Cook. Uh, we've got some interior art by a different artist named uh, Taryn Fiddler. Uh, I've uh, edited the book again, uh, cleaned up a bunch of the typos. I've rewritten some stuff. I've done some continuity fixes. Uh, there's going to be a uh, novelette in the back uh, from the point of view of Cassandra Lynn. Uh, who is a sort of fan favorite character. I actually had my, my patrons vote on which character they wanted the story from. I did not tell them what it was for. Uh, it's got a new intro and uh, you know a bunch of new stuff we're adding uh, uh, as sort of add-ons to the campaign. You get slip cases, uh, things like that. There's a bunch of new artwork, like I said. Uh, so it's very exciting, uh, very fun project to work on. And so I uh, hope folks will check that one out. And of course, another Bane author, Steve Diamond, is helping you with that. Yeah, yeah. So Steve uh, has worked uh, on, I think he's worked for a few like little small presses that he's run. He did Larry Korea's uh, Heart Magic reprints, which are, man, they look so good. If you've seen the Vault editions of those books, super awesome. So, uh, and Steve's the man, so it's been great working with him. So. Now, we do have another curveball for you, specifically that Bane Editor-in-Chief Tony Weisskopf is also in the office today. Hey, Tony. I didn't know you were here, even though I saw you before the episode. Good morning, <laughs> no. okay. Now, we've been trying here on the Bane Free Radio Hour with Christopher to do two purposes. We want to introduce the longtime Bane readers to Sun Eater yes. and the Sun Eater readers to Bane. Yes. I guess, Tony, for any of our longtime Bane readers, what is it about Christopher and Sun Eater that stands out to you? I, I think it's his it's basically sunny optimism that just shuts. No, it's true. I, yes, I, I, I'm joking. In your in your writing, um, it is um, I think darkly densely textured, like really good dark chocolate. Um, cool. There there, I'll are, take it. there are there are many flavors that that, uh, that that come through, especially if you have a sophisticated palate. Uh, <laughs> um, the sun eater is uh, a great densely constructed uh, future world. Well, thanks. Galaxy thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, so it, so I think Bane writers, Bane readers, um, Bane writers too, um, will enjoy it um, because it's going to be a world that they can dive into. Um, it's going to be, it, it, it's eminently bingeable um, and it's a series that, uh, that rewards um, rereading um, and uh, uh, in close attention. So, uh, but the characters are also just absolutely fascinating, um, and uh, so I think there's a lot for um, for Bane readers who like the Lee Aiden series, and Bane readers who like the Honor Harrington series, um, and Bane readers who uh, like Serpents of War um, are gonna are, are really gonna dive into the Sun Eater series and enjoy it. And for the Sun Eater fans who are who are coming over from other publishers, um, we we welcome you. I, we are going to try to make you feel as comfortable and as at home um, with the series as you have been before. Um, there will be no surprises um, other than the cartoons. We are going to have cartoons in there. No, I'm again, I'm kidding. And, and also for Bane readers, um, you've been reading um, Christopher's work all along. Um, we he's he's appeared in. Uh, Six or five or six um, anthologies at this point. Ooh, I about? edited, I think, eight. Edited, uh, edited eight. Um, and I've been in a couple others. Yeah. yeah, it's probably about a dozen. Yeah, if I had to guess. Yeah. So, so welcome aboard, Christopher. Thanks for having me back, boss. <laughs> Good to be. Here. Good, glad to have you here. All right, off to work. Now, the other thing, Christopher, is. You've talked a little bit about it, but I really want to get into it on this one. Uh oh. It's a couple years from now, let's say. Disquiet Gods and Book 7 have come, been lovingly received by audiences, sold well, and the main light on the Sun Eater series is, at least for now, done. What comes next? Do you have any tires you're kicking at the moment? And what can we expect from you next? Well, like I said, I, I, I don't like to be too specific about long-term things, because I will change my mind. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure what's going to be the next project. It's kind of going to depend on the, the way the wind's blowing when I finish book seven. Uh, Are there any last things you'd like to say to our wonderful viewers, listeners, and s some longtime fans, and perhaps some new ones? Uh, only thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I hope you all will go check out the, uh, the first books in the series, uh, even though they are not published by Bane, you know. Uh, but, uh, but I hope you look forward to uh, Disquiet Gods when it rolls out in uh, April. Uh, it's coming April, of course, this April, nearly passed, so it won't be too long now. 
Uh, but until then, I'm going to get back to work on it, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm sure in, in the time that we have been recording this video, Dave Butler has read the book four times because uh, the man is a machine. So I need to get back to work. So, uh, you know, until then, guys, we'll see it. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Rocchio. Disquiet Gods will go be on sale everywhere. Fine books are sold on April 2nd, 2024. This has been Sean C.W. Korsgaard for the Bane Free Radio Hour. Until next time, read on. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. It was evening, ship's time, and most of the passengers were in the lounge, grouped in twos and threes for conversation, social drinking, or the occasional game. At a table near the back, Johnny, Drew, and Harmon had managed the synthesis of all three in the form of a light Aventine sherry and a particularly nasty round of trisec chess, a game Johnny's red pieces were steadily losing. You realize, of course, he commented to his opponents, that such friendly cooperation between you two is prima facie evidence of collusion between your two companies. If I lose this game, I'm swearing out a complaint when we get to Asgard. Never stand up in court, Harmon rumbled distractedly. His attention had good reason to be elsewhere. Drew was slowly but inexorably building up pressure on his king side, and too many of his own pieces were out of position to help. Drew's the one who's apparently moonlighting from the Joint Command's tactical staff. I wish I was, Drew shook her head. At least I'd have something to do during the war. Market developers don't get much work when the market shrinks. For a few minutes, the only sound was the click of chess pieces as Drew launched her attack. Harmon defended, and Johnny took advantage of the breather to reposition his own men. Harmon was a move behind in the exchange and wound up losing most of his cozy castle arrangement. "'Tell me again about this collusion,' he said when the flurry of moves was over. "'Well, I could be mistaken,' Johnny admitted. Harmon grunted and took a sip of his drink. Going to be the last Aventine sherry anyone back home gets for a long time, he commented. A real pity. War usually is. Johnny hesitated. Tell me, what does the Dominion's business community think of the upcoming hostilities? Drew snorted. I presume you're not talking about the shipyards and armaments manufacturers. No, I mean companies like yours that have been working with Aventine. Maybe even the troughs, too, for all I know. Like you said, Drew, you're losing a growing market out here. She glanced at Harmon. With Aventine, yes, though I'll point out for the record that neither of our companies deals with the troughs. Dome is very stingy with licenses for that kind of trade. You're right, though, that the outer colonies are going to be missed. Anyone who deals with you feels pretty much the same way, Harmon added. But there's nothing obvious we can do about it. About all we can do is hope our first attack is so brilliant and decisive that it ends the war before too much damage is done. Drew moved upon, simultaneously opening Harmon's king to a new threat and blocking an advance from Johnny's remaining rook. Harmon waved at the board. And if the Star Force has any brains, they'll put Drew in charge. What was that? Johnny had felt it too. A dull, almost audible thump, as if someone had dropped an exceptionally heavy wrench in the Mansana's engine room. We've just dropped out of hyperspace, he said quietly, sliding his chair back and looking around. None of the others in the lounge seemed to have noticed the jolt. Out here? Drew frowned. Aren't we still two weeks inside trough territory? It may not have been voluntary. Johnny stood up. Stay here. I'm going to the bridge. Don't say anything to the others yet. No sense panicking anyone until we know what's going on. He reached the bridge to find Captain Davi Tarvin presiding over a scene of controlled chaos. 
What's the situation? he asked, stepping to the other's command station. Too soon to really tell, Tarvin replied tightly. Looks like we hit a troughed flicker mine web, but so far the usual spider ships haven't shown up. Maybe they won't. Wishful thinking. Sure, but that's about all we've got, Tarvin nodded. If a trough shows up before the drive's recalibrated, we've had it. You know as well as I do how long our weaponry and plating would hold against attack. You've been studying the ship enough lately. Johnny grimaced. About half a minute if they were determined. What can I do? You can get the hell off the bridge, a new voice snapped, and Johnny turned to see Ray crossing the floor toward them. Status, Captain? Minimum of an hour before the drive can be fixed, Tarvin told him. Until then, we try to be as inconspicuous as possible. Hostile at 97-60, the navigator interjected suddenly. Closing, Captain. Battle stations, Tarvin gritted. Well, gentlemen, so much for staying inconspicuous. Mr. Ray, what do you want me to do? Ray hesitated. Any chance of outrunning him? Second hostile, the navigator said before Tarvin could reply. 290-10, also closing. Right on top of us, Tarvin muttered. I'd say our chances are slim, sir, at least as long as we're stuck in normal. Then we have to surrender, Johnny said. Ray turned a murderous glare onto him. I told you to get lost, he snarled. You have no business here. This is a military situation. Which is exactly why you need me. I fought the troughts. You almost certainly never have. So you're an overage reservist, Ray grunted. That still doesn't... No, Johnny said, lowering his voice so that only Ray and Tarvin could hear. I'm a cobra. Ray's voice died in mid-word, his eyes flickering over Johnny's form. Tarvin muttered something under his breath that Johnny didn't bother notching up his enhancers to catch, but the captain recovered fast. Any of the passengers know, he murmured. Johnny shook his head. Just you two, and I want it kept that way. You should have told me earlier, Ray began. Be quiet, sir, Tarvin said unexpectedly, his eyes still on Johnny. Will the troughs be able to detect your equipment, Governor? Depends on how tight a filter they put all of us through. Johnny shrugged. A full bioscan will show it, but a cursory weapon detector check shouldn't. Behind Johnny, the helmsman cleared his throat. Captain, he said, his voice rigidly controlled. The troughs are calling on us to surrender. Tarvin glanced at his screens, turned back to Ray. We really don't have any choice, sir. Tell them we're an official Dominion courier and that this is a violation of treaty, Ray said tightly, his own eyes on the displays. Threaten, argue. Do your damnedest to talk our way out. Then, he exhaled between clenched teeth, if it doesn't work, go ahead and surrender. And try to get terms that'll leave all of us aboard the Mansana, Johnny added. We may need to get out in a hurry if we get an opening. We damn well better get that opening, Ray murmured softly. All of this is your idea, remember? Johnny almost laughed. Middle-level bureaucrat indeed. The operation had barely begun, and already Ray was scrambling to place any possible blame elsewhere. Predictable and annoying, but occasionally it could be used. In that case, I presume I'm authorized to handle the whole operation, including giving Captain Tarvin orders. Ray hesitated, but only briefly. Whatever you want. It's your game now. Thank you. Johnny turned back to Tarvin. Let's see what we can do now about stacking the deck and maybe providing a little diversion at the same time. He outlined his plan, got Tarvin's approval, and hurried to the Marine guard room to set things up. Then it was back to the lounge and a quiet consultation with Drew and Harmon. They took the news calmly, and as they all collected and put away the chess pieces, he outlined the minor and theoretically safe roles he wanted them to play. Both agreed with a grim eagerness that showed he'd chosen his potential allies well. He was back in his cabin 15 minutes later, hiding the most sensitive of his Aventine data on random sections of unrelated mag cards when Tarvin officially announced the Mensana surrender. Obeying the captain's instructions, he went to the lounge with the others and tried to relax. He succeeded about as well as everyone else. A half hour later, the troughs came aboard. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. 
praise, thanks, gratitude, and welcome back to Christopher Rocchio and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.